at least 50 Conservative MPs are set to defy Rishi Sunak and vote against the bill, with the Business Secretary Kemi Badenoch reportedly among them. Uh, and it's not just sitting MPs who are in opposition. The former Prime Minister Boris Johnson has also made his thoughts known. We're banning cigars. Mm. I and mean, what, what, what is... I mean, maybe that, maybe you all think that's a great idea. I just can't, I just can't see... What, what, is the, what is the point of banning... Well, the, the party of Winston Churchill wants to ban... <laughs> I mean, donnez, donnez moi un break, as they say in Quebec. You know, it, it's, it's just... It, it's just... It's just mad. Couldn't agree more. Meanwhile, the chief medical officer for England, Professor Chris Whitty, has remember urged him. MP. Yeah, remember him. Yeah. Has a next slide, please. <laughs> has urged MPs to ignore the opposition and vote with the government, insisting the ban will save lives. Let's speak to Barrister Stephen Barrett, who is against the smoking ban. Well, you'll be pleased to know, uh, Stephen, that uh, we're against it as well. Uh, lay out your reasons why uh, you don't want this law to be passed. So I'm not against the smoking ban. I can't. I can't be pro or against any policy. But what what I am what, what I'm want to talk about is Chris Whitty. Okay, <laughs> the, what's happened? You're is against the definition him. Of what, <laughs> well, well, what, what what has happened is the definition of what is pub, uh, what is political in British public life has broken down. And I don't know if that makes sense to, to non-lawyers. I always apologise. But if if the, if the definition of oranges had broken down and we were, we'd all be wandering around calling oranges watermelons, then you'd notice that the definition of oranges had, had broken down. The definition of what is and is not politics has broken down. And because of that, people like Chris Whitty have become political by accident. Because he's advocating this policy, he's calling for this ban, and he's, he's making up all sorts of arguments and reasons for it to go through. Well, that's not his job. He's an expert to advise the government, but it's not his job to advocate and call for policies. And he's really crossed the line. And I do wonder if, you know, we all lived through the pandemic. We all saw what colossal power he and a handful of others wielded during the pandemic. You know, power does sort of, humans get addicted to it. And what's happening is the chief medical officers are all advocating in favor of this policy. And that's really, really wrong. They should be saying, here is the limit of my expertise. Minister, if you wish to call for this policy, then you call for this policy. And they should be staying out of it. They really shouldn't be advocating policies. And if we don't stop this now, if we don't realise what doing politics is, which is advocating for policies and changes of, of, of law, then we're, this is just going to get worse. And in, in the, it'll be always done in the name of, of good health. But, but there'll be all sorts of every bizarre political policy that, that Chris Whitty's ever dreamed of will start being, being becoming law and be, being pushed through the Houses of Parliament. He's not elected. And until he stands for office, he has no legitimacy. But, I mean, actually, what you're saying there is quite an interesting point because not only is, uh, you know, definitions disappeared, including woman, uh, language itself is no longer language. And like you said, politics is no longer politics. We've got an increasingly, you know, spineless cohort of MPs who don't say what they think, they don't actually seem to think, let alone want to impress upon themselves the labour of thinking or scrutinising something. It's all about sort of ticking the, the boxes of what's nice and, you know, what's not going to get me cancelled and at the same time all of these sort of faux institutions and quangos and unelected officials whether they're supranational organizations or chief medical officers are the ones running the world it seems uh, but you know in, yes. in, in terms of from a legal perspective what i think is balmy about this policy look i'm not a fan of smoking and, you know, I'd rather most people didn't smoke. That's great. But what I think is balmy about this policy is how that's actually going to be enforced. Because we're talking about this in the early half of the show. If you say to people, right, do you want 15-year-olds to be able to buy cigarettes? Well, no, absolutely not. But at some point, these people born, you know, at the right time in 2008 are going to be 20-year-olds, then 30-year-olds, then 40-year-olds. And someone who's 41 years old is going to be able to buy the packet of cigarettes and they're not. Yes, and it, you can see the 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 oddity of it, and it, it's why we haven't constructed laws like this before. I mean, you can write laws however you want to. I mean, Scotland's got its ridiculous hate crime crime law that doesn't work because it's just so badly written. But the, this one, it, it's going to be difficult to see how it works. I mean, I technically gave up smoking in two thousand and six, but I'm I'm weak willed, and uh, <laughs> I have been known to, to su su submit at, at parties and and cad catch a fag. Will 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 people start saying, oh, I can't give you one because actually you're too you're you're just. But I can give Stephen one, but not you. I, the practicalities of this don't seem to have been very well thought through. 
constitutionally what we must do is push the MPs back to saying that this is the decision that, that they that their voters want them to take and they must vote on that way. They, this this jazz handing by saying, well, all the chief medical officers want it. This, this is not how policy should be made. You know, it's not, we are not governed and ruled by experts. It's one of the reasons that I hinder myself in public life and I'm not going to be pro or anti this ban because I like to, to, to notice the role of an expert is to be in, in my field, it's law. So my role is to be expert in law. My role is not to tell you my personal political opinions and to force them on you. That That is a form of tyranny. Mm. You know, that's dictatorship. And I, you know, we, oh, are we going to get democracy back or not? I doubt it. I think that <laughs> no, it's gone. I doubt it. <laughs> now, stay with us, Stephen. Let's head back to the House of Commons where the smoking ban debate continues. And let's see if anybody is making any sense. Northern Ireland is just as much as we do in England, uh, Wales and Scotland. I will, I will take... I'm most grateful to the Secretary of State in giving way with regards to a specific point on tackling illicit tobacco. In 2016, I raised that question with the then Prime Minister because in Medway, we had one of the highest selling points for illicit tobacco. And the maximum sentence that can be given for the supply and sell of illicit tobacco is seven years. As part of that strategy to deal with illicit tobacco, will the government now be looking to increase the sentencing for the sell and supply for illicit tobacco? Because at the moment, she's right, this party is committed to lower taxation. But tax avoidance and evasion cost this country two billion. And if we don't get this right, you know, with regards to imposing this mandatory, uh, the banning of cigarettes, which I don't agree with, because I think we should do it through education and awareness, you are going to get more people buying illicit tobacco, and that cannot be right. Um, my honourable friend gives me the ideal opportunity to talk about my favourite criminal offence, which is cheating the public revenue. It's a criminal offence, very settled law. Uh, it has a maximum sentence of life imprisonment, and I have deployed it myself against the organised crime gangs I referred to at the very beginning of this speech. So uh, an ingenious... Oh, no, sorry, that's far too... Um, please don't think I'm praising myself, Craggy. A, 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 a sensible <laughs> prosecutor, sorry, a sensible prosecutor will always, will always uh, look at that criminal offence because that gives the... Uh, it's settled law, it's good law, and also it has the maximum sentence of life imprisonment for those who indulge in it. And so in conclusion, Mr Speaker, I'm going to now, I'm afraid, conclude, because I have been... Uh, in fairness, I've been generous. Uh, in conclusion, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we want to build a brighter future for our children and our grandchildren. This means moving from the tossing sea of cause and theory to the firm ground of result and fact. The result of this legislation will be to free future generations from the tyranny of addiction and ill health. The facts include that parents are worrying about youth vaping and they want us to take on the tobacco and vaping industries. And the result and facts of this will save hundreds of thousands of lives, reduce pressure on our NHS and increase millions of young people's chances in life. The decisions we make today... Interesting, she's uh, tossing around the facts about vaping. Her parents so don't like their kids this. doing it. Well, there you go. That's oh. a hard evidence for you. Yeah, That's yeah. following the science. We all love yeah. a bit of science. Impose some more laws on us. Good idea. Hey.